Hello, everyone. We are going to allow a few minutes for attendees to arrive. Hi everyone, we're going to allow another minute for people to arrive. I'd like to welcome you all to the third part of the series, Summer Tea with Curators, The Five Senses. No. I am Lauren Shea Warner, Membership Engagement and Stewardship Coordinator. This five-part series is an informal exploration of the five senses through the lens of the museum's collection. Today's speakers are Yao Wu, Jane Chase Carroll, Curator of Asian Art, and Emma Chubb, Charlotte Fang Ford, Class of 83, Curator of Contemporary Art. If you go to the next slide, um, I can show you after the presentations, there will be a Q&A. Feel free to submit a question in the Q&A box located on the upper left of your screen. I will now turn it over to Yao. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's episode on smell. Today we'll be talking about two works. On the left, you will see two paintings that I will be talking about by a Korean artist, An Jung Sik, from late 19th century, early 20th century. It depicts flowers and plants and vegetables, so it's a representation of smell. Whereas on the screen on your right, you will see a work by American artist Robert Rauschenberg that my colleague Emma Chubb will be discussing, and it's work that actually smells. So we will first go to the two Korean paintings that I, will, that I will introduce to you. Next slide, please. So um, these two Korean paintings are now in the format of hanging scroll. They are ink on paper with very faint colors. And you will see here that on the screen, I juxtaposed these two paintings with a American painting that my colleague, um, Danielle Carabino, introduced to you um, in the episode on taste two weeks ago, if you have attended that episode. Um, so the point is that the genre of still life is actually found across cultures and also, of course, across times. Um, even though we use the term still life in the title right now for the Korean painting, I just want to be, be mindful that, you know, this very term has an association um, in Western art, you know, with its origin in 16th century, 17th century Dutch painting. Whereas in East Asian painting, there has also been a long tradition of depicting birds and flowers, for example, and also uh, objects of scholarly interest and, pursu and pursuit. So by the 19th century, which is around the time when these two paintings were done, um, this interest in this genre depicting treasure vessels with flowering plants also developed very much into a very distinctive genre. So I will pull out that with the term still alive, um, it's a loose translation of um, a genre that has been native to the Korean uh, painting discourse for a very, very long time. And also with this juxtaposition, um, you know, you might wonder 
how come the American still life was included in the taste episode and um, how come you know this um, Korean two these two Korean paintings um, you know are included in the um, in the in the smell episode and that's a very good question because a lot of times the five senses you know are not really uh, separable from each other and particularly with you know depictions of um, you know fruits and and vegetables the the two senses of taste and smell are are inseparable right so um, now um, I will go to discuss the specific elements in the two Korean paintings to make the argument that even though these are two uh, inseparable senses, the sense of smell um, you know, is, uh, has a stronger presence in this painting. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we'll look at um, the painting on the left first. And here um, in the foreground, you will see um, depictions of uh, chestnuts and also cabbage. And then in the pretty big vase in the background, you will see a couple of uh, branches of palm blossoms. And then in the plate, um, uh, sort of in the, in the middle ground uh, on this plate, you will see um, some fruits that are uh, round shaped and yellowish. This is a type of fruit called loqua. And on the side next to the border of the painting, um, you will see a type of fruit. It's a citrus fruit that might not be so familiar. So I do include an image of this fruit um, on, the, on the side. And this is a fruit called uh, Buddha's hand citron or Buddha's hand. And apparently, you know, this name, um, you know, is taken from or is uh, derived from the shape of this fruit itself, which resembles the idealized shape of Buddha's fingers or Buddha's hands. And this fruit has a very strong fragrance. Even though this fruit is edible, um, it's rarely eaten, sometimes maybe for medicine. Um, it's more often than not used as offerings um, in ritualistic settings, um, particularly in the Buddhist context. And also, um, it's often used to perfume rooms. So with that, I would argue that if you were to imagine yourself in this very setting, you know, that this uh, still life is depicting, you know, this strong smell of the Buddha's hand would permeate your entire room so that you are really immersed in, the, in this environment, uh, environment of this very strong sense, right? A sense of smell. And um, I will note that all these uh, flowers and, and uh, vegetables and fruits I've identified, most of them do have the seasonal association with the season of winter. So with that, let's look at the painting on the right. And here again, you've got a vase with uh, some lotus flowers and in the foreground you have lotus root, you have water uh, cow trips, and then uh, grapes, and once again, uh, Buddha's hand citron here. So. Um, this uh, vessel here in the middle ground, I include a prototype of it on the side as well. So this vessel ac actually reflects an interesting antiquities in 18th century, 19th century, not only China, but Korea as well. And how did this prototype, this uh, imagery got transmitted to Korea? You know, it was really due to the economic and dip diplomatic ties between the two countries. So this kind of imagery of ancient Chinese bronze vessels. They were disseminated to China through painting, through prints, and also sometimes uh, through imported uh, collectibles. And um, for this very particular uh, two paintings, the artist, uh, Andrew Sik, he was one of the last uh, court painters at the Bureau for Painting at uh, the jo uh, Joseon Dynasty Painting Court, um, the Court Painting uh, Academy. Um, so Joseon Dynasty was the last imperial dynasty in Korean history. Um, and he was actually also part of the um, ambassadorial uh, entourage that was sent to China. So it's not surprising that he got very familiarized with Chinese cultural trends and uh, got uh, interested in this kind of uh, passion for Chinese antiquities. And I will also say that this interest in cross-cultural motifs or cross-cultural exchange is not only manifested through the pictorial elements that have identified but actually also through the poems inscribed on the two paintings. In the painting on the left, this is a poem from uh, Ming Dynasty China, also slightly earlier than the other poem. Um, it really, uh, it's a poem that describes the subject of pl plant blossoms. So, so very fitting for the very painting that we see here. Whereas on the right, this is a poem from late 18th century from Qing Dynasty China, slightly later. And, uh, the original poem described the poem getting drunk on a snowy day and then uh, writing this poem. What's interesting is that in this very inscription here, 
the specific reference to the snow day, to the snowy day, got eliminated. So um, that's actually pretty fitting because when you think about it, all the flowers and plants depicted in this painting right here, they are more for the season of summer. So maybe, you know, the modification of the poem was intentional on the part of, you know, the, the painter or the, uh, the person who inscribed this poem. So with the seasonal references, I also speculate whether these two paintings, you know, um, they, com they are complete in themselves. Right now we have them as a pair of hanging scrolls, but would it be possible that originally it was a set of four paintings depicting all four seasons? And this hypothesis is actually not unfounded. If we could go to the next slide, please. In the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection, in fact, there is this 10 panel folding screen that's also done by a uh, Joseon Dynasty court painter from exactly, you know, around the same time. And um, it also uh, depicts treasured vessels with flowering plants, um, the very same genre, paint, uh, genre for this kind of painting. Um, and you know, this um, is a set of 10 panels. It's mounted as a, a folding screen. So it's also very likely that what we have as hanging scrolls now in our collection uh, have, you know, at one point been remounted as hanging scrolls, whereas originally they were part of a, a larger series of, of folding, uh, folding screens. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. I will also just draw on a detail in the folding screen, which is the panel on the far left, which I show on the right um, on the screen here. You will see that these two works, um, the far left panel in the folding screen in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection and our summer scroll, they resemble each other very closely in the sense that they both depict uh, lotus flowers as a summer flower. They have some bronze vessels in the foreground, but even the poem is exact same with the modification that eliminated the reference to snowy day. So that also leads me to wonder, you know, how um, it's possible that at the court painting bureau, um, artists, they were um, not necessarily painting from objects um, directly, but maybe following certain patterns, so to speak. So with that, I will turn to my um, colleague, Emma Cha. Thank you, Yao. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So I'm going to talk about a piece in our collection by the artist Robert Rauschenberg, who might be a familiar name to a lot of people uh, in the audience. And this is a work called Ballot, which is from a larger series uh, called Unions that he made in 1975. And I wanted to tell you first why I picked this work. Um, smell is kind of an interesting charge, as Yao pointed out, to talk about art, because often I think when we go to museums or we see art, in an uh, exhibition context, we often expect to have our sense of sight activated, uh, maybe touch and hearing, but less so smell and taste. Um, and so it was fun for me to think of, to take this uh, topic very literally and pick a work in our collection that um, very distinctly has an odor to it. And that is this work. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that it still smells quite strongly, even though it was made 45 years ago. Um, which tells you a little bit about maybe what it smelled like when it was being made, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, and so again, I think the smell really makes this piece distinctive, um, but also it's a work that connects to some of the other themes that Yao evoked in her um, discussion, which is cross-cultural exchange, as well as works that exist in a series, so seriality. Um, so those are a couple other threads that I'll be pulling in this. Um, and I think one of the things that we learned when this piece was up um, at the museum about a year and a half ago in our permanent collection galleries was that the smell was often um, the thing that you encountered before you encountered the, the work visually. And so we're going to use smell to kind of pull ourselves into a um, more of a kind of series of histories that I think are really interesting about Robert Rauschenberg's work, but also about contemporary art history a little bit more broadly. Um, so this is a very kind of flat sculptural object. When you look at it uh, in the photos and in the gallery, um, it's got this kind of horizontal mass that's uh, in this kind of brown and taupe colors, very textured surface. We have some details on the screen. You can kind of imagine the tactility of it as well. Um, the bulk of the piece is rectangular, but then there are these four ropes that are looped through it through this kind of slit in the middle. Um, and then that drape 
towards the ground and then it's hung uh, by the two kind of smaller ropes that you see in the upper corners and you can see a little bit of a detail of that that's kind of embedded in the material. Um, and it's um, ballot is one of two editions that Rauschenberg did for Gemini GEL, which is a printmaking uh, group out in Los Angeles. And he made these while uh, in Ahmedabad, India uh, in May and June of 1975. Um, and that was his second time in India. His first time was in 1964 when he was traveling with Merce Cunningham's a world tour. Um, and that's when he met the Sarabai family. And it's with the Sarabai family in Ahmedabad that he stays, uh, he and his whole kind of entourage uh, with his son and his, uh, the group from Gemini when they go back in 1975. Um, and uh, the materials, I think, and you might have already intuited this from reading the captions, give a sense of why this work has a very um, pronounced uh, smell to it. And then it's because they incorporated very fragrant spices, spices that you might associate with uh, Indian cuisine in the body of the work itself. Um, so they're structural to the piece. Um, so we have fenugreek and tamarind as well as turmeric. Um, and then those are kind of built into the mud that's used to kind of build out this, um, the work. And then it's dried. And so here we have the kind of dried version of that. But the spices weren't just about fragrance. They really played a utilitarian role and that's why they were used in making this. Um, and so that was something I found really interesting in doing the research for this and working with my research assistant who did a lot of work. So I wanna thank him, Jonathan uh, Levia, who is a grad student at UMass. Um, and so the turmeric was said to keep bugs away um, and then tamarind and fenugreek worked with binders. So they actually helped kind of the material to uh, have structural integrity. And then the other addition that he did with Gemini in, in Omnibad in 75 was entitled Bones, um, if anyone wants to check that out. Um, so I think this work is important and really fascinating. It's uh, for a couple reasons. One, um, if I told you I was gonna talk about a work by Robert Rauschenberg, I doubt this is the work that might have popped in your head. Um, it's not kind of, it doesn't call forth what a lot of people I think associate with his work, um, but it does actually embody a lot of the key kind of concepts or core threads in his artistic practice over the decades, um, really around experimentation and collaboration. Um, so this is a piece and actually, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, you get a sense of the collaboration from these archival photos that were taken in 75 um, during the making of these works when Rauschenberg and his group were guests of the Sarabai family. And this is what I think is some of this really interesting story that should be better known in our history and that should be the subject of future research, which is about how the Sarabai family invited a number of artists in the 70s and 80s, although a number of artists had also been there um, in the 50s and 60s as well, from the US to go and be their guests at their house, which in Compound, which was designed by the French architect Le, Le Corbusier, um, and make work. Um, so Rauschenberg was the first to go in, starting in 75 in this kind of new group of artists, um, but subsequently artists who are also in our collection, like Linda Banglis, Guy Saunier, Frank Stella, and James Rosenquist also went as well. So artists that are really strongly associated with American art in New York um, had this whole chapter to their um, work that I think we would all do better to um, know more about. Um, Ahmedabad is a really important city in Indian uh, history and presence. It's an important textile center historically. Um, it's also a place for paper production, which was why Rauschenberg was interested in going to do uh, addition with Gemini there. Um, and it also played a really important role in India's independence movement um, in the 20th century. And it's the site of two of uh, Gandhi's ashrams. Uh, and the Sarabai family who hosted Rauschenberg um, are really important industrialist family. They were big arts patrons. And so their story is kind of woven through the history of Ahmedabad in India, but then also um, in this way through the history of uh, American artists as well. Um, and then I guess the last couple things that I'll say before we do the Q&A is to go back to this idea of experimentation and collaboration that I think is uh, really compelling. And so in these photos, you can see uh, on the left, Rauschenberg in the foreground to the left, and then seven other people around this outdoor table. And they're all working on uh, the ballot series um, and, and kind of pressing uh, the mud. And you see that a little bit more clearly in the photo on the right um, into the form that then 
dries and becomes the work um, like the work that we have. And so you see the bucket with the mud to Rausch, next to Rauschenberg in the photo on the right is As Asha Sarabai, who was a member of the family. And so members of the family and other and artisans from the area were brought in to join. So it's a very collective, collaborative, um, social experience for making art. So not the idea that we have maybe of the artist alone in their studio. Um, and there was, I think, from what I understand from the process, there was a lot of trial and error, which I think speaks to artistic pro process often, often. There's a lot of experimentation, kind of figuring out what this new material could do. Part of why Rauschenberg chose this, to use these specific materials, was that they were used in local building practices. Um, and so it's a really kind of uh, great way to build a building in the sense that if you use uh, mud and, and, and these binding agents, you can get a building that um, is cool in the summer and warm in the winter, um, which I think we could all see the advantages of. Um, and I think the last thing that I'll say um, is that I, I think one of the things that's so nice about this work is that it, because it still has a smell that's obviously not as strong as it was in 75 when it was being made, um, it is something that even when we're in the gallery, we get something that evokes the smell of making art. Um, so I think a lot of artists who work in studios or people who visit artist studios, there's a lot of smells associated with the studio, whether that's turpentine or oil paint or um, wax or anything like that. But that smell often dissipates by the time the work goes on view. And so this is a piece that even when we see it in a gallery kind of calls us back to the site of its making. And that feels um, really compelling to me. So I will leave it there and turn it over to April uh, to manage our question and answer session. Thanks, Emma. Um, and thank you both, Emma and Yao, for the, those interesting um, comments that you had about these works. Um, I'm April Gallant. I am a member of the curatorial department, and I'm going to help uh, pose your questions to our panelists. So uh, the first question is for Yao, and it is regarding the poetry on the scroll works. Generally, would the illustration inspire the artist's choice of a poem or the other way around? Thank you for that very important question. Uh, it really speaks to, um, you know, one key element in, um, you know, East Asian um, sort of artistic tradition, which is poetry and painting. They, they often go hand in hand together. Um, and it can happen both ways. Um, sometimes there would be, you know, uh, sort of um, pictorial depictions of famous um, poems or get inspired by uh, famous poems. But then there would be also be times where a painter would depict, um, would, would um, make a painting and then, you know, himself or maybe uh, his uh, peers, you know, um, on that occasion would inscribe on the painting with a poem. Um, in this case, um, it's kind of interesting um, in the sense that for me, I feel like it might have been more a coordinated effort to associate the specific poems with the images. So uh, with the last image I showed you, you know, um, the uh, exact same motif of the lotus flower and then this very poem that was modified from a Chinese poem that, you know, has taken out the reference to the uh, to, to snow to make it more fitting for the season of summer. I, I suspect that it, it, had, it somehow became a pattern at the uh, painting, um, you know, bureau uh, at the Joseon court. Um, so that the painter um, or whomever inscribed the paintings, they would know that, you know, the poem and the painting, they would, um, always come together um, on one composition, in one composition. Thanks, Yao. Um, so the next question is for Emma, and it's for Rauschenberg's ballot. Do we have any idea the amounts of spice that were placed in the work? Um, I ask because the piece is older, yet we're told the fragrance is still there. How do you think uh, Rauschenberg calculated how much of each spice to include for this lasting power? So that is a great question. I don't have an answer because, but I'm guessing it was a fair amount of the spices that were incorporated. Um, and I have, I'm, there's some really great oral um, archives and interviews that were done by um, the Rauschenberg Foundation that I'm still reading through. And I think, if I see anything in there, I'd be happy to share that out. Um, but I can only imagine that based on, I mean, when we unboxed this to hang it up in the galleries, I guess about two years ago, year and a half ago, it was all anyone noticed. And it's funny also in reading some of these um, testimonies by members of the Sarabai family and Christopher Rauschenberg and others who were um, 
involved in there in 75 is that the smell is something that even in recording interviews in the 2000s, they comment on. Um, so that's not an answer to how much specifically, but I think um, copious amounts probably. And if, uh, if I find out, I will happily share that information. Thanks, Emma. Um, so there's another, there's a lot of questions that are very curious about the title of the Rauschenberg. Um, wondering if ballot might, re might refer to a ballot box or um, any relationship you might see between the fact of the odor of Rauschenberg's work and the titles, ballots, or the series titles of unions? Yeah, that is a question that I have. And we've actually, uh, April and I were talking about that earlier this week. And uh, Jonathan, who has been my summer research assistant, was looking into it as well. And we haven't found anything conclusive. Um, I think Rauschenberg was sometimes uh, vague about his titles um, and uh, not maybe wanting to overdetermine the work at the same time ballot union i mean this is you know it wasn't an election year but it was coming up on an election year you know presidential election in 76 in the us and the bicentennial so um it's hard not to think that there was some uh connection or he's textually locating it in that space um and of course this slit right looks like something you could move something through so one could i mean you could kind of build out from that and think about so these thin ropes that are going through are knotted and tied and they go in a loop so there could be something about circularity it also could be you know maybe a word that he let I, you know so um i haven't i haven't found anything that um conclusive about it but it's something that i've been very curious about so i'm not surprised other folks were as well um but but it is a very evocative and very specifically kind of locatable title in that way Thanks, Emma. Um, so this next one is for Yao. Um, so Yao, can you please read us uh, the two poems? Uh, I wonder what um, this person means by, by read, meaning um, reading out the poem like word for word or? I think that's what, I think that's what the, the visitor is interested in. Um, Sure, I mean, I can read out the poems um, in, in uh, sort of uh, for the Chinese characters um, uh, as they are written in Chinese characters, um, but um, I'm not sure if this closely resembles how, you know, Koreans in um, 19th century uh, would have read them, um, but I can, I can give it a try. Um, so the one on the left would go something like this. Um, Yang Zhou Shi Ge Yan Fang Chen and the one on the right will go um, something like this um, as it's inscribed on the paintings. Um, uh, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Yao. Um, so um, there is a lot of curiosity about the ropes, which unfortunately I think we don't really have an awful lot of information on. But um, if you want to address that, there's also a question about any conservation issues with the Rauschenberg beyond the fading of the smell over time. Um, I don't, we didn't spot any conservation issues when we installed it. Um, and but I also don't think it had been on view for a long time. So it was, uh, came to Smith not that long ago as well, I believe. Um, so um, it's in pretty good shape. Um, I would be curious, I mean, since, since it's an addition, we could um, reach out to some other collections that have it and see if they've encountered anything, especially if it's been on view longer. I was concerned um, that, you know, after having it up for about a year, year and a half, that we would lose some of that sense of smell. Um, but now it's back resting in uh, collection storage. So um, it is a really interesting question. I do, it's funny, I found so much about, uh, about the making of the structure of the kind of mud and the spices and that. And um, you can see in those photos that the ropes were already on the table when they were building the pieces, but no one kind of really theorizing about it yet. And I think that speaks to um, this being a place in Rauschenberg's um, history and art making that we would all benefit from learning more about. And I, um, realizing is that may be a little strange to have picked an artwork that raises a lot of questions that 
we don't or I don't yet have answers to, but I think that's part of the fun too of working with artworks in a collection and getting to know them and um, thinking about what questions we need to find answers to or that might lead us to different um, lines of research, which Yao also modeled and sort of thinking about what is the relationship of these scrolls to potentially two more or to other collections. So um, yeah, lots of lots of good questions to have more research done on for sure. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for Yao. And so for these scrolls, do you think the artists created these on commission or would they be for private or personal use? Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, you know, normally we would know the um, conditions around the production from the inscriptions. Um, but unfortunately, you know, these two inscriptions are really um, just the poems. I mean, we know the artist by the seals that have been stamped onto the paintings, but, you know, there is no documentation whatsoever of, um, you know, the, the conditions around the production of the two works. Um, given that he was a court painter, uh, it was very possible that he was produced for people who were associated, who were associated with the court. But also, you know, um, his time, you know, uh, he, he lived on and, you know, even past the collapse of the uh, Joseon dynasty. So I would imagine that with sort of the weakening of the Joseon dynasty, um, he, he might have got some private commissions as well, um, but we, we really don't know. All right, thanks, Yao. Um, and actually, just a, a clarification. So evidently, um, our visitor was wondering if it's possible to um, translate the poems into English. And if you um, have those translations, we can actually probably send them um, afterwards. But if you have those translations, it'd be great to hear the poems. Yeah, I don't have the word for word translations, um, but I will just say that, you know, for the one on the left, uh, it's really a poem about uh, pl plant blossoms, uh, particularly in the season of uh, kind of late winter and, and early spring. And it's, you know, all those um, poetic imagery and associations with the flower. And then uh, for the poem on the right, uh, it basically talks about how this poet uh, got really drunk on a snowy day. I mean, actually in this inscription, no longer a snowy day, but like he got very drunk. And speaking of that, you know, the um, bronze vessel is very fitting because that's actually a, a ancient wine vessel. So there is that association there as well. Um, and he um, composed this poem and he made a reference to a earlier Chinese poet um, by the name of uh, Li Qinglian, who is uh, Li Bai, pretty famous poet from the Tang Dynasty. Thanks, Yao. Um, so next question is for Emma. Um, so Emma, are, what works would you show this work with at SCMA and, and what collection works do you see it would resonate with? That, that is a great question. Uh, thank you, Trevor, asked that. Um, so when we had this up in the past, um, it was part of a reinstallation of our um, modern and contemporary post-1950 galleries around the acquisition of a painting by Alma Thomas. And in that installation, I was really interested in a couple of parts of her work and kind of pulling that out in connection with other works in our uh, collection. And part of that was thinking about how artists um, always exist and have social lives and exist in relationship to other um, artists. And so uh, I put up the Rauschenberg thinking that it spoke to one this moment of collaboration and exchange and, and um, uh, connection with the Gemini folks, but also his family with his son going and then the Sarabai family as well. Um, but then also with his relationship that he had to several other artists in our collection like John Chamberlain. Um, so, which was another work that we had up on view. Um, one of the other things I really like about this piece, um, and I think my colleagues in the curatorial department have heard me say this a lot, is that we don't have a lot of kind of uh, funky or strange or sort of idiosyncratic looking works from this time period in our collection. We have a lot of things with like smooth edges. And I like that this is a piece that on the wall, it kind of droops and it's, it's kind of strange and it smells and it's, it's, it doesn't kind of resolve itself um, quickly into like a nice clean frameable edge. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, lumpy and textural and um, droopy. And I like that kind of component. Um, and, and I think that that's something that's so important in a lot of contemporary art uh, from the 60s and 70s is this sort of 
think about Robert Morris's felt pieces are these things that kind of drape off the wall and go out into space. And this is a piece that I think does that um, nicely. Um, but yeah, I think there's so many pieces in our collection where artists are really experimenting. I mean, we've got a great selection of, of cardboard pieces by Rauschenberg as well that I think would be fun to show, um, or also other works from the Gemini um, uh, prints uh, series um, that we have a great collection that April actually could say a lot more of because she shepherded uh, those coming into our collection. Um, but thinking about how artists work in editions, and I mean, this is an edition that if we lined all 15 up, they'd probably look quite different. And so it's sort of odd also as an edition, it's not, you know, one print being, or, you know, um, plate being pressed 15 times, it's 15 hand shaped uh, objects by at least eight different people. Um, so I think that would be another kind of fun thing to pull out around making and repetition and difference um, and lumpiness maybe. Thanks Emma. Um, so uh, the next questions are for Yao. Um, so about when did artists in the Korean royal court begin to use Hangul for ins inscriptions and accompanying poetry rather than Chinese characters? Yeah, that's a good question as well. For um, just background information, Hangul is the uh, Korean um, writing system. It's the, um, you know, the alphabet that uh, transcribes uh, Korea, the Korean language. Um, that was invented uh, in the 15th century. Um, but um, for a long time, you know, Chinese characters were uh, still very much used by the uh, educated class. Um, and, you know, all the way up to, to the 19th century here, um, you know, as we see in this example, particularly for works that reflect um, antiquarian interest, you know, um, that's part of Chinese culture. You know, the Chinese characters uh, inscribed Chinese poems would be only fitting. Um, in terms of having Korean Hangul, um, you know, um, annotations on paintings, I've seen those on um, some of the um, kind of more documentary types of paintings. For example, those document uh, royal processions, etc. But as to when that start, um, that I have to, um, do some more research to give a more accurate answer, but that um, that that does exist um, in even earlier periods um, in more sort of um, processional paintings, for example, that are not considered um, kind of fine art per se, but more documentary in a, in a way. Um, and sometimes the Korean characters and the Chinese characters they go together. Thanks, yeah. So there's. One more question. Unfortunately, there's so many great questions and we really only have time for one more. Um, and that's, um, can you discuss the fading of the pigments? Does that support the theory that they were originally screens and exposed to light? Um, I'm not exactly sure if we have really, um, you know, um, visible fading um, of pigment per se in these uh, two paintings. As I said, that sometimes you know the colors might be very faint in, in to begin with, um, but um, fading of pigments. I mean, works can uh, get dark over time, especially if they're you know on silk. Um, but I don't think the colors here um, necessarily have faded that much. All right, thank you very much, and thank you all for such terrific questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. But um, if you would, if you have a question for either of our panelists, um, you can email it to the SCNA member site. And um, Lauren uh, Shea Warner will tell you a little bit, a bit more about that. But thank you all for coming. And I will turn it back over to Lauren. So I would like to thank you all for attending today and especially thank Yao and Emma for their fabulous presentations and wonderful Q&A. If we didn't get to your question, um, please feel free to email the SCNA members email located on your screen. We hope you can join us for the third part of our series, or I'm sorry, the fourth part of our series. It's going so quickly. The five senses touch. Um, we hope you can join us then. And um, there will be a link sent out in your email tomorrow, or you can also find that on our website. We hope to see you next time. <laughs>